So, yeah, Renny, it was really cool to play your game. This is not your first game that you launched on Kickstarter. Like, can you tell something about your board game, like, journey? Yeah, I mean, my board game journey is rooted in video games in two different ways. Like, real video game position was at a company called Floodgate Entertainment. And it was a company founded by founder of Blue Sky and Looking Glass Entertainment. Like, the Thief series, seminal, like, PC video game developers. Some of them ended up going on to make Floodgate, which made mobile games before smartphones. J2ME, Java, all these different games. And I managed, I was going to school in Boston, did an internship slash co-op there. And every Thursday they would play board game. And when you're a kid growing up in the US, like I'm sure this is a familiar story um, for anyone in the US, right? Like there is a very traditional as Parker Brothers and Hasbro. That was like 90% of your experience. So suddenly I was being introduced to Bang, Cash and Guns, Robo Rally, um, and uh, I know there were like a few others but those made like a huge impact on me, literally just before the iPhone actually launched. Like I got to watch the App Store launch at a company that made pre-smartphone mobile games. Yeah, we would meet on Thursdays and not every Thursday, but like Robo Rally, it didn't matter because we were at a video game company that lunch was over. We just kept playing the board game. Robo Rally is just this incredible game. I haven't played it in a decade, but it kind of stuck with me. Similarly, um, you know, Cash and Guns, and both of those were very like physical and nice pieces or like, you know, Cash and Guns is very play acting. You're holding an actual foam gun pointing it at each other. There are other games that were, you're starting to work on like social deduction and things like that. That was like the first thing where I was like, oh, okay. And, and one of the game designers had had a board game shop. He had actually had that before he had become a game designer there. And so I remember spending eight hours once at his house playing Descent. Um, <laughs> Um, and it was like a Saturday. It was one of those cool things where I got to hang out with, you know, the full, I hung out with the full-time crew. They pretty much, had, you know, were happy to adopt me because I was making art for them. So if, because it's all There's story. a lot there. Yeah. <laughs> it's all going on. So first you went on to an intern to a company that makes mobile phone games. Yes. Before like mobile phone games was popular, basically. Kind of the inventors of that kind of genre, if I hear this correctly. Mm -hmm. Right? Uh, uh, yeah. I mean, early, no, I was actually late mobile game design. Just an interesting place to work to see what it was like for the launch of the iPhone. And then you had on the first days at a company, you always played board games with your coworkers. You were at that moment, you were also like focusing on game art or just you were like, ah, I can make this cool art and then people were going to say oh I, I have a game ID or like how how did that work I was a 3d animation major in college yeah that was that was my focus I studied uh, Maya I studied 3d studio max in high school um, our school was lucky then enough to have one class that did that in the early 2000s so I, I knew I wanted to get into game development and so I decided to go the art route versus the programming route so while I was at school at Northeastern and in Boston, they have what's called a co-op program, which is in the middle of your degree, you can leave, you're expected to not go to school for a semester at a time and instead work at a company. On all schools nowadays, internship is part of the program. So, but if I hear this correctly, in your time, it was not, it was very new. Well, it wasn't just that, it wasn't just an internship, like a summer internship. It was a, it was expected from like January through the summer. Like, so you would get like almost, you know, a half year internship. So I managed to get a job take, making very little money. They paid me, I think almost half as much as the next company, but the team was much more interesting. Like after that internship, you kind of immediately graduated? Nope. So actually that was my second internship. I had worked at a company working on a Pokemon Flash educational series the prior year. So I had wait, been doing a Pokemon educational <laughs> what? <laughs> wait, wait, what? <laughs> okay, I, I yeah, no, this is um, it was by a company called 360 Kid, and they made things like the Sesame Street website, and this was 2007. 
I spent six months in that prior internship, essentially animating flash videos. And this was called the Pokemon Learning League. You can find evidence of it on YouTube. It's fun. That was in the middle of my degree. And then I did the internship at Floodgate. And then I had one more year of school after that. That was when I entered the industry, like properly. So you entered the industry properly or were you immediately going game dev, but the board games, like when, when did that like, Good question. Become yeah, and you're, and you're like, unpack, <laughs> unpack more here. Um, that was like an inspiration for what board games could be. I then went into largely art and animation. Because I am interested in all aspects, I did learn flash game development. So I did program my own things. I was, you know, working on iPhone games. But yes, I spent a year uh, working in Facebook games and then went into the indie mobile game industry. And I worked for Tiger Style, a company that made a game called Spider, The Secret of Bryce Manor and Waking Mars. During the development of these, I was just staring at the screen too much. And it was like I could feel my eyesight going bad. Like, I could just, like <laughs> it is going bad. And I know this because I have very good eyesight. I can see the leaves on a tree a block away, and I can feel that getting worse. And so, it, okay, yeah. wow, well, that was a very good eyesight. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So with that, I just decided I needed to get away from the screen. Particular inspiration for a board game was I wanted to make a pirate game because there is a game called Dread Pirate, which is a beautifully produced game, but the gameplay is very simple. I got it at Barnes and Noble. They have these like infamous or famous like red sticker sales, like in the board game community where you can get things like super cheap. So I got Dread Pirate and I just basically said I could make a better board game than this. But I, I, I mean, uh, do some research, right? I saw that Kickstarter didn't really succeed or was that another one? <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. I failed on Kickstarter. So it may not, I may not have beaten Dread Pirate on that front. Yeah. So Scoundrels, basically while I continued to do indie both game development was kind of like my side project. The tactile nature and the social social nature, I was engaged by both of those features of a board game. Those are things that you just don't experience the same way in a video game. And it failed on Kickstarter in 2015, partly because I didn't really understand the business side of things. I think there are flaws in the game. I think there are always flaws in a game, but I really liked it. I had a couple friends who loved it. The major weakness I would say on the game design was the longer a game is, the more people will not accept luck as a factor in victory. Fair enough. Uh, and luck should not be more than 50%. Uh, yeah, it's interesting and tricky, right? Because there's also people will talk about how if you're playing, you know, Twilight Imperium, there might be like dice involved at the end. You know, or they might be a card flip or something like that. Yeah, I do. Um, I do like uh, that games uh, surprise me because otherwise I already know the outcome too fast, and I will be, you know, I will be bored at a, at a fast pace because I'm like, yeah, I can already see if I'm winning or not, and especially when the feedback loop is very like not like in a positive way, that I'm like, okay, you own some board games, especially board games, sometimes have that that the person that gets higher and higher gets just or more important important it's hard to be them and if you don't have the random factor then you already know it and i'm like okay yeah indeed that's with the time then indeed the time should be like okay fast a winner or not basically yep. that's my own perception yeah. on it well and and you're you're not alone there right and it's like in terms of the uncertainty uh, I'm a huge fan of Brian Upton's work. He wrote The Aesthetic of Play. He worked on Rainbow Six, a game from the late 90s, which it's a first person shooter, but it's all about planning your attack. And he was like wondering why it was fun to stare at a doorway and not do anything. That's such an interesting concept. He's like, why is this fun? Why is this thrilling that I'm just not doing anything? And people will like that as much as they like running around in Doom or Quake or Counter-Strike. And essentially it builds on the thing you just brought up, which is um, uncertainty. We like uncertainty and we just kind of there's an area we enjoy it most. We kind of want to know what our next immediate thing is going to do. But what we're excited by is when we're not sure what the next two, the two or three steps after that will be, 
based on our immediate action. And if we know if we know step 10, that is four. exactly what happens in theory of fun, right? Like because with this example of tick yeah. second toe, that when you already know mm -hmm. how it works, it's suddenly not fun anymore. So I think that entails into his discovery as well. Uh, right. It's interesting. Yeah, that's why I, I really like board games that surprise me because yeah, otherwise I'm yeah. <laughs> why would I play it, right? Or, right. Games yeah. whether or not they're board games. He extends it beyond games, so I think it doesn't quite work as well, you know, I think the the connection there. But it is that like those who experience media, different forms of media bring us joy in different ways in anticipation might be the best aesthetic of playing. So uh, Scoundrel, right? Uh, failed on Kickstarter, but you were like, you still continued with it, right? Yeah, so so the game failed, and I was just kind of like, okay, well, I guess I'm done with, you know, board games for a bit. Shortly after it failed, I moved from the Bay Area. Um, after college, I had been living in the San Francisco Bay Area, and then I moved to Chicago, took a break, and then a year later, tried to work on it again and decided I was going to fix it and spent two plus years working with like uh, board, you know, hanging out with board game designers because the Midwest in the US is actually a really good board game design community because there's winter and people are trapped inside and they play board games, I think more than people in uh, <laughs> warm climates play board games. I, okay. I don't know if that, that's that is a massive like generalization but i do think there is like something to be said there to wrap it into the present and my next game in 2018 a couple of my board game design friends basically said randy stop working on scoundrels um, they were just like <laughs> they were just like you're getting stuck on just this one loop just go try uh, yes. something else mm. and so then it was within the next like three to six months that I ended up coming with up with both the concepts for Roll in One and what would become Gunnet. Oh wait, so Roll in One was like kind of a push forward for the idea of Gunnet? Uh no, um sorry. So they I came up with them both at the same time and they were kind of independent ideas um mechanically. Gunnet, I didn't quite know what it was yet. Like I was still working on it. And roll in one, I kind of like made it and I was like, oh, I see what this is. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of was working with them in parallel, but I kind of knew the boundaries of roll in one. So for anyone not aware of roll in one is a completely, it is not a uh, pirate game. It's not a car chase game. It is a dice golfing game. The mechanical premise was what if each different die of the poly six polyhedrals is a different golf club. So I essentially spent two or three years. This is around 2019. I actively worked on both of those designs. So Roll in One came out of nowhere. One of the other board game designers that we would meet had to come up with a golf game, but it was a dexterity golf game. His name is Ben Moy. And basically I had this idea branching off from his idea. And, you know, he was like, that's that's not my game at all. If you want to explore that space, you may. Wait, wait, okay. So you, you kind of got him to say, you may continue with your own ID because he kind of also helps you with it? Yeah, or, or yeah. So I, I love crediting other people. Um, I think it's uh, I think it's important because everything we do is just mm -hmm. like a cumulative process. Had it, what uh, dexterity games are generally games, you know, in board games that are about like physically moving objects, right? They might be like flicking or pushing, or there's, you know, the big one is Crokinole. And Ben had the idea, he made this like you would build golf courses and then use dice and dice towers, and you mm -hmm. would essentially play golf with dice and so it was very much a like physical like space that he was designing a golf game but he was using dice as the golf balls it's getting very I, close to each other's ids basically well and i actually had no idea oh. and then it was simply <laughs> oh, i played God. his idea i played mm -hmm. his game and then i was interested in the outcome of the dice rolls as you were playing he was using a much more dexterity based thing and i was kind of interested in oh you've played this game and your dice ended up over there but it also rolled an eight 
should we use that? And he was like, well, that is not really part of his system. So then... Ah, I see. Yeah. So you build it up when you were playing, you were thinking, oh, what yeah, if so, this, yeah. this, this happened? Okay, that's cool. Did you have something similar with Gunnet? Like, did you kind of play someone's game and you were like, ah, I'm going to... You know, have a different theme, have a different <laughs> thought about it. Like, how did that uh, start? So, if I go back to uh, the earliest ideas for Gunnet, were I wanted to be in a car chase. I wanted to be in a car in an action movie because I tell people there's something so amazing about just like when you see the people sitting in a car in that like moment before all hell breaks loose and everyone's kind of like just like handing each other guns and then they're just kind of like sitting quietly or like you know there's other movies you know reservoir dogs where you know they're just shouting at each other and they're like mm -hmm. i'm gonna die um but like there's something about the being together in a car with this tension building up around you that i really wanted to explore i can tell you my first idea was basically Machi Koro, but I didn't know it at the time. And so this is like a decade ago. I was mm -hmm. kind of like, oh, what if like, I don't exactly remember how it went, but it was it was along the lines of, you know, you collect certain things and then you roll and the outcomes yeah. of the cards and the dice roll together. And then I saw Mich Machi Koro and I was like, oh, maybe not. And it suddenly didn't work. Like, mm -hmm. I, I just realized this, this didn't make any sense. I didn't really yeah. understand why I was unpacking that. And okay. then the idea evolved by giving everyone everything in the car. So the initial version of Gun It was called Getaway Gang. There was a board and your car had to get to the final, like the advance to the far end of it. And so then you would put other vehicles around. Each person was selecting from a set of four uh, like arrow cards. And then you would, I think you would turn, change the order cards. But the idea was really like, we're all in the car. We're looking at a direction, we're pointing, we're acting a direction. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there wasn't like any game that inspired it directly. No, I think it is, it feels very unique. That's why I think it's it's really cool because yeah, it was at the start to set it up and to explain the rules was, is a bit of a challenging because it's not really like a, another game that I know, right? I mean, when, when the group was, was ready with it, it was uh, very clear that the two minutes was a very smart. I think that has just been that nice, like little edge of like, mm -hmm. oh, we have enough time, but we also, oh, if we just made a really mistake at the end, it feels <laughs> like, oh no, what did we do, right? Uh -huh. so, yeah, yeah, yeah. The two minutes is the classic kind of, you play it over and over and over, and you just kind of like. I think I settled on two minutes midway through the process. I wish I tracked that particular sort of detail, but I don't usually track that level of detail. Um, most of my feedback methods, so like in terms of gameplay, I will take notes and then I have a Google spreadsheet and I will just like say, okay, this is the day, this is how many play testers, this is kind of where I was. And then I will just write anything that I've written down in my like notebook after the playtest. So if we can get a grasp here, right? How many playtests are in this little little, little prototype? Uh, there <laughs> just, are... You can give average or just a thought. Yeah, I have easily 78 recorded playtests. That is like independent of just like working on the game and independent of like working on it with my friend Marcus, who's probably the biggest play tester of it over the last few years. So I don't even like track those ones. That is just like going to places, meeting with people. And do you mean like 78 places just four times four because there are four people? That's 78 games. Um, so where, yeah. times four. Yeah, in terms of people that have played it, I would say probably 50% of those players are like once or maybe twice in those games i would say half of those people are in that spreadsheet once when you say times four uh most of the time i did pursue a four player game because that is just it yeah, honestly maybe, that's yeah. that's that's what <laughs> excited me the most um, mm -hmm. was a full car but there is also a lot uh, a bunch of three player games there are a number of two player games and i've actually settled that i'm pretty happy with the state of the two player yeah i haven't tried that yet but it's on the cards right saying that some elements uh, are changing 
when you are doing a two player um yeah yeah that's no longer the case so you have an older version right but like i said you have an <laughs> Okay, in a so two player, <laughs> it's not it's not just you. Yeah, in a two player, um, you actually just represent two crew members each. Oh, okay. Yeah, I so have I, tried I have to, a very unique yeah. version now. <laughs> you definitely do. Yeah. So so for any for anyone who's not aware, the idea right is you're you are in the middle of a car in the middle of in an action movie, and it's like you and you're acting. And I was really trying to carry that forward for three and two players. It's only ever like you sitting in a particular seat. For balance reasons, in two player, you just now represent two different people in the car. So you now ignore anything that says like two player rules and you just play normal four player, essentially act as two characters. And that was because it was better that way or there was something balancing off or like what? Balancing. Was balancing okay so i should not yes. try it <laughs> i mean maybe i try can... it and then i say oh this is really shit <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> you can yeah you know i mean you could try the final version and have that same feeling yeah no the um the address for balance is like an interesting one mm -hmm. in a co-op game balance doesn't necessarily have to work the same way mm -hmm. right the expectation of balance is not quite the same yeah. because you're not competing right it's like when we're competing if it's if a game is imbalanced the, yeah the, 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 so either the, the game is difficult like a bit of like pandemic is sometimes really depends on which cards you're drawing it can be suddenly like what how do how can we be on this side of the map it's impossible right but then it's like, oh, we try another time, right? Yeah. You also have like different modes. I think they're really cool. They're like really based on. <laughs> oh um... yeah, you are getting you are getting the early one, right? Yeah, that's, <laughs> is this is... all changing? <laughs> yes. This is... Yes. Okay. So, those... so this is all okay. Cool. <laughs> yeah. so the, I think some of the text in there might be the newer text. Yeah, the version that I gave you is. I would often, yeah, just it basically you sleeve, and this is a very standard board game uh, playtesting mm -hmm. method, right? Is you just, you sleeve a normal set of cards and then you like yeah. insert paper, you know, for your new rule. Sometimes you like literally like scratch it on a sheet and then put it in the card and you're like, there it is. Okay, there's my new rule, which is a very different process for video games. Like I knew I wanted different scenarios because mm -hmm. I knew I wanted to unpack it's not just one movie, it could be any number of movies. Mm -hmm. I really liked the thematic like recognition that Fast and Furious exists and owes something of its legacy to things like James Bond, right? You know, it's like, um, I feel like it's, you know, the latest Fast and Furious bear a lot of similarities to the mm -hmm. late 90s James Bond. and But at the same time, there were other kind of action movies going on, you know, and the pulp novels from the 1950s, they're all connected in very interesting ways. And as I was working on the game, it, it was just like an interesting way to change it up, which is like, okay, you're trying to earn the most points. The core scenario is trying to earn points, but I am making a game about violence and maybe it would be worth unpacking what if, what if there were a game which was a, a scenario which was about trying to not earn points? Yeah, this is, I think you're talking about this card. The goal yes. is less experience is better. The reckless mm -hmm. road. And I think which one is really difficult, I think, is uh, earn more experience points every round. Uh -huh. <laughs> Will yes. that be still in the game? Is that like. <laughs> oh, that is the advanced. Yeah, that is the most difficult one by far. <laughs> So yes. it's, yeah, you must earn one, it's like, okay, earn one point, the next round you must earn more than one point, and if you earn like four points, then now you must eat be four points. It's super interesting. I actually, it's by far like my favorite, like design-wise. It is challenging and it is like mm -hmm. intriguing, and it has also shown me the luck of the draw can impact your success there. So in this game, right, you're generally trying to earn excitement points by causing cars to blow up other cars and, you know, creating openings around your car. Um, I love it that you in... call them excitement points. <laughs> uh -huh. yeah. I, I went through a lot of different things. They were almost victory points at some points. No, uh, excitement uh, points is cool. <laughs> so, um, oh yeah, so with the, like, with that really advanced scenario, you must earn more each round. And it's like, how many rounds in a row 
can you do that? Well, your early rounds are a major factor, right? You know, like plenty of things like roguelike deck builders and various things like that, right? Early decisions you make will really, you know, snowball. And your game is in a different way. It's just like how much damage add on in, in, in on the exactly. board because you still have those free cards, right? Well, right, and right. you have like a scenario card like this that you can choose, which really made like very interesting uh, in-depth choices. <laughs> so that mm -hmm. was really cool. And then you had, of course, the innocent, which was like the most annoying thing to, to have around. <laughs> so... <laughs> yes, I'm sorry there are innocents on the road. <laughs> yes, <laughs> which uh, was, uh, was, uh, was uh, challenging. And um, yeah, of course, a barricade uh, stays in the game. Uh, but okay, so my friends, I uh, I like to ask them like, hey, yeah, just give some uh, feel about the game. And they were like, really? Oh, it feels so much like a car chase. Well, why can't we not like pull up the brakes? And then uh, if your motor is behind your car and uh, the motor is going over your car, because that you see a lot in car chasing. <laughs> so if we can pitch something, we want to pitch that. Okay, <laughs> so. okay. okay. I love it. I, so I, I want you to do that. So, so like you, you've pointed out to me probably one of the big things that if I end up expanding on the game, mm -hmm. there's kind of two directions that I see. The first of which is, how do I add more players? Do we add another car? Do oh, we add bigger yeah. cars? Things like that. Do we like change the size of cars? That's going to completely kind of mess with the actual logic of the way it works. But the second thing is, how do we make maneuvers more interesting? How do we make your position on the board more interesting? For anyone who hasn't experienced Gunnet, which at this point is going to be most people, um, <laughs> the game is really interesting because you have a direction, you have a turn order, and you have an equipment. Everyone shares the 12 of these, right? A one, two, three, four, a forward, back, left, and right, the mm -hmm. shotgun, Uzi, pistol, and steering wheel. And you're just exchanging those things. You know, whatever you're holding is going to have an effect on the board in front of you. Adding the spatial puzzle of maneuvers that have other consequences, there's already a lot of mental work that needs to be done to process the sets of arrows that, so all the vehicles mm. have arrows, those arrows are collateral damage, and when you wreck a vehicle, it's gonna explode or clean or whatever in any number of ways, right? This like, motorcycle is gonna go. Like this, Exactly. Like if you suddenly add positioning into that, you're now completely upending your mental work on the domino effect in front of you. People often want to like move a lot more, but I found that that's just like, that shifts essentially yeah, what Yeah, I, I don't think on. in our, no, we didn't really want to often move. It was even like, oh no, you just we want need it occasionally. to move. <laughs> you want to, yeah, yeah. And, only and so only I think, we wanted to kick out the innocence in our way. Right, that was... <laughs> right. And I think, yeah, I think, I think I want to, I want to explore and understand that a little bit better, mm. how I could do that without messing up the core thing to me, which is you saying, I'm going to deal with that. That's the thing that I liked exploring was the social kind of feature of the planning. Yeah, um, or you could maybe the innocent, like have maybe a car that you can just drag it in your car. I don't know. At least it's not in the, in your way. Oh, man. <laughs> you can do so I, much. I, I honestly want to write these things down. So like, I'm going to, like, I'm, yeah, for anyone type, like, this is a crazy idea and it's not going in the game because it's going to just like add way too many rules. But um, there's stuff in there. Anyone's like, he's doing work right now? No, I'm just, uh, I'm definitely writing a couple of these things. So. Um, nice. Yeah. Right. So if I hear yeah. this correctly, so it's now on Kickstarter. It's uh, maybe a few days still on. Hope on my uh, my editing time and sleeping time. Um, but then you are going to go in another development phase, right? Some things mm -hmm. are still changing, or like how how was your plan with? Sure. Yeah. So um, a very truncated explanation. 
when you kickstart a game, it takes a couple of weeks before you even get the money. It's often like two to three weeks. I am not going to tell the printer it's happening until, you know, the Kickstarter campaign ends. Once I tell them that, they will then say, okay, I've worked with the printer already long pack uh, on my last game. I basically give them a list of components and they say, okay, this is what we need, right? These are the files types we need. Um, these are the different things we need. Over the next like one to two months, I will get them files. They will then send me a test copy. They will like kind of like do some setup. They have their own artists and kind of like, you know, printing engineers and stuff who will kind of like take a look and make sure everything is good. Any custom components, like there's going to be like a custom die, prove and check that. There's going to be a paper insert that will also require a little bit of slight bit of design outside of just me giving them an illustrator file. Kind of once we go back and forth, usually there's like one to three iterations where they'll like send things and they'll just be like, how is this? Sometimes they do like a, just like a completely blank thing. Just here's all your components. Yeah, over a few months, we will essentially line up things. The back and forth takes a week here and there. Once everything is approved, I'll pay them half the money. They will print, put it in their queue. I'm not the only game they're making. Mm -hmm. They'll print, you know, 1500 minimum units, uh, maybe more. And then over, yeah, probably like three to five weeks, that'll occur. Then the next step is they'll get everything like shrink wrapped and put onto um, pallets. Once they've done that, I can hand it off to a freight company. The freight company will take, it will take, you know, anywhere from like five to eight weeks or 10 weeks to get to the actual warehouse where the product is going to be. Mm -hmm. And then from there, the warehouse per people will take them out of the cartons, out of the cases, put them in individual boxes. Mm -hmm. And that can take anywhere from like one to 20 days, depending on the warehouse itself. And how do you make decision which company you want your game to be printed or which company you use to send your game? Like, how was that procedure? So I am using the same printer that I used for the last game and largely because it was a really good process. I did research and I reached out to a bunch of companies and very simply, anyone who's like interested in making board games, the fun thing is most of these companies will happily give you quotes. You just give them a spreadsheet and you say, my game has 14 tarot cards. It has, you know, 48 poker cards. It's It needs a punch out, you know, like tile sheet that I want to be like two millimeter thickness, or you might not even know what it is. And they'll come back at you and they'll say, are you looking for two millimeter thickness, you know, cardstock? Are you looking for one millimeter? Are you looking for three? And then the nice thing is you can usually just say, quote me on both, you know, quote me on all of them. And then you give them the list of the components and they'll come back at you with a quote. This is how much it will cost in the next, you know, three to six months. And then you make the decision and I make the decision on two factors, which is cost um, with three factors, reviews and things I see from other people. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like you want to know that like other people have experienced this and have had good experience. Sure. Um, the cost and also for me, a key feature is communication. Do they respond at all? or within a reasonable time frame, I don't need you to respond within six hours. Mm -hmm. But if you respond consistently within, you know, one to three days consistently, like the number of companies that I've worked with that don't respond. And then you're like, well, I'm definitely not going to work with you if you don't want to even like email me back. And you say free and you were too. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I said like, um, Oh, I think I was holding it like this. <laughs> yeah, I thought like um, you were going to say free thing, so. Oh, yeah. The the other one is just um, getting responses from other people online. Like, like, there are a lot of groups out there. If anyone is ever interested in, like, doing this, uh, Reddit has a decent uh, subreddit called Tabletop Game Design, a small batch publishers uh, Facebook group. You can ask questions and people will point you there. For anyone, just a cursory glance, I always just say Stonemeyer Games, their website. So the people behind Wingspan and, you know, uh, Scythe, Jamie Stickmeyer has documented in great detail his process from Kickstarter creator to now a mid-sized publisher. And he has immense detail on the entire production marketing design process. Okay, that's cool to, to look at. If I saw correctly, there were like five people working originally on your game at Kickstarter, I saw. Oh, in the credits? Your credits are a bit different than the most or like, are they 
as a group or is it just you you really as uh, a story? I think a lot of people I think a lot of people do that yeah no I'm just I'm basically acknowledging everyone that played like a key role in making mm. Gunnet I'm probably going to give the biggest credit to Dustin Schwartz who is my copy editor and rules editor this is what he does mm. he edits rule books and cards and makes them legible and so it's like I can I can write the funniest like coolest you know like car action game but if you don't understand how it works um, it's no good. And so Dustin Schwartz um, did the editing. Chris Serrato helped design the rule book uh, in terms of graphic design. And I kind of carried the font choices and color choices and spacing a little bit mm -hmm. in elsewhere. Ambrose Park, they did the scenario art and uh, Michael Dashow did the logo and Trent McDonald, the music um, for the timer. Um, yeah, because there and, should be, I mean, there should be an app to get her or something? Yes, so there's going to be like a very simple website. This wants music, right? Mm, like when yeah. you have a timer going off, a sand timer is good, but music is better and you want the ticking clock. And so I have a friend who's a video game composer, Trent McDonald. He's an awesome composer. He, he's prolific. Um, and I know him from the Bay Area game developer scene, the East Bay. He has helped create a bunch of music for a bunch of my stuff. And the person who actually put the timer together, which is there, but we're not really like publicly posting it yet, is uh, Marcus Ewart, uh, who is a friend and a uh, very good web programmer. Yeah, a lot of, of your friends were helping on this game if I yes I knew most of these people personally or I knew half of them personally although I would always tell people don't feel like you have to or should work with your friend it may not work it's often better to like work with people and become friends than become friends and then work with people because it may backfire and then suddenly you're like do I still want to be friends with someone you don't need to name names or whatsoever but I hear some experiences um we just have different processes you know it's like mm -hmm. you might have someone who is more stringent about how things should be managed on you know like trello or you know like or you have someone who's more relaxed about communication and if these are just friends of yours and you decide to work together just be aware that like just because you're friends doesn't mean you're going well together there are different processes and also your friends you're not co-workers like if you have someone that is a friend and not a co-worker your social experience is is built around something that is anti-work or you know it's, it's not yeah, built around sure. work when you bring work into that space don't, you can't necessarily predict yeah i just wanted to, to to ask your own vision on it because i hear there was like a bit of uh, an opinion there yeah yeah well and i think it's it's partly coming from the indie game scene. In the indie game scene, you know, people are much more widely dispersed across um, different methods of working. It is less predictable, yeah, how all those work methods are going to result in, you know, like how what what drives you, how you operate. If you know someone through a nine to five, then you know someone through, you know, it's like if you know someone through an indie game, it's like, it's a different space. It's a different productive and creative process. We are all already like diving a bit in the indie dev, but then it's kind of digital and like board game. Like, what is your opinion? Like, how is it different to make a board game or to make a digital game? Apart from that it's on a digital platform. I think the design ideas bear a lot of similarities. It comes down to like, is the decision making fun? Like for me, when I'm designing a game, you know, you can go to Sid Meier's, you know, a game is a series of interesting choices, a good game. Mm -hmm. And I agree with him. But as soon as you start actually taking your idea and putting it into a physical thing, a board game, a tabletop game, just the productive process is very different than a digital process. You know, it's like, okay, I don't need a programmer. I need to think about the factory. Like you kind of diverge in production. I think the margins are also worse on physical games. When you make a physical game, you're making a product. You're making a thing that might last a lot longer in terms of physical thing, but it also means I'm gonna pay the factory um, probably about three bucks a copy, then gonna cost some amount of freight and customs and various other things 
machines to get it to a warehouse. So suddenly it's going to be like $8 a copy. And then if I'm getting it into a board game shop, the board game shop needs to make money. And so their shelf space is precious. Like most physical retailers often buy at what's called keystone pricing, which is like 50% off because they need to pay their workers. They need to pay their rent. They need to pay themselves and ideally make a little profit. If I'm selling a game for $30, most shops are actually buying it at 15. So suddenly, and if I'm going to ship it to the shop, it, my $8 a unit is like suddenly cut in, you know, like again, between eight and 15, I'm making $7 on that. But sometimes there are other people involved in that and they might take 25 cents off of that thing. So mm -hmm. now I'm making like $6 a unit. And I'm hoping that that can like afford the next print run. So all of these things are like super interesting and completely disconnected from video games. Right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, it's like if you have a video game that like lands, go back 20, 30 years, mm -hmm. these problems are real again. Right, they're, they're the same, like you're in some of the same space. But um, in video games, if you like my game, I say, great, here's five keys, share it. Like I'm sending you like a text mm -hmm. file, you know, instantly here's 5,000 more keys. We're facing a lot of interesting stuff, you know, with Valve and itch.io and various other things because this is actually like a super complicated question about, you know, like what are Valve's rights in regard to Steam keys and other, you know, stores selling them, there is an actual energy cost, right, for computers and servers and all of that stuff. But it is, you know, like 0 0.008 cents or something mm -hmm. like that yeah. per unit. Yeah, and for so, board games, yeah. it's uh, it's a lot more expensive to get it right. on the shelves. Yes. And, and, and you make a video game The you know, like, like be very brief on the video game side because I just talked a bunch about physical. A video game side is like a really interesting one because it's almost the opposite. Like as you start, you can do a lot of prototyping, but as soon as you like really start to like we're programming our foundational like gameplay, everything starts to calcify around that. Like every other programming system decision might be kind of informed by that thing. There's so many features that like start to calcify around that like one thread of the core of the game and you get more and more locked into a lot of aspects of that thing. That feels to me a little different than uh, board games. Yeah, yeah, I, I totally agree. Uh, I agree with this. So after this board game, are you going to continue to make other board games or will you be like, well, I'm not sure yet because, well, it takes <laughs> so much like effort, time, and it's very in, in, insecure, basically. Mm -hmm. I would like to come back to Scoundrels. I do think Scoundrels is a good I game. Love it. It's coming back, this whole interview, back to yeah, Scoundrels. Yeah. I, I would like to come back to Scoundrels. I think uh, Scoundrels is a fun game. I think everyone's in a cooperative era. They, you know, Gunnet is co-op. I partly made this game for my wife because she likes co-op games. And she said, you know, Gunnet is probably her favorite of my board games. But Scoundrels, Scoundrels is a good game. And I think there is an audience for it. And I think there is always an audience for a good pirate game. Yes. I think there is like, I don't have have another board game. I have a couple video games that I have been exploring. The biggest reason I might trying to figure out how much those do or don't come next might be audience. I have now started to say, okay, here's a board game, here's another board game. You know, it's like yeah, they, like they the work I've done. They expect you to to have a board game, and they're like, wait, what? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and that is something that you can't assume. Oh, mm -hmm. like hey, I have a mobile game. Yeah, great. And your board gamers are just gonna be like, all right, tell me when you have another board game. Like there is a real worthwhile thing to note is just that audiences don't necessarily translate over mediums mm -hmm. um yeah so being yeah i will see that. if uh, this medium also uh <laughs> from my interviews if <laughs> interviews with board gamers <laughs> are working uh -huh. we will see that um, but questions. i think they are yeah. very close related right because it's mm -hmm. uh, the thoughts behind it to start to make it and to push it i think it entails with the indie dev journey of being an entrepreneur but that's my personal view yeah no i think i think that's i think that's accurate yeah well and i think there's a spectrum right too because like i think you could draw a line between like video games and board games i think you could draw a line between indie and triple a you know it's like mm -hmm. the experiences of you know i've never worked at a triple a company and it is clear those experiences are very different maybe one day uh so uh but yeah board game i think it's harder to also get in 
to start making board games because it, it is harder to make one uh, physical and to get a mm. publisher like excited. I mean, you choose for Kickstarter, yes. right? So basically, did you try to get a publisher or were you like, no, I want the crowdfunding community to to help me? Yeah, good question. So uh, Ben Rossett um, was one of the kind of the leaders of the board game design group that I was in when I lived in Chicago. I don't believe he's there anymore. He ran kind of a monthly playtest night um, and he worked for Panda Games. Uh, they're kind of one of the big kind of board game publish uh, printing companies or mid-size maybe. They're big amongst like Kickstarters. I talked to him, he is also a board game designer and his feedback was basically, it's a job whether or not you, if you try to get a publisher, if you try to go Kickstarter, it's a job and just be aware, you know? And it's like, I think that's probably another like lesson that I would give to people is just at any time that you're thinking about turning your idea into a commercial product, you just have to acknowledge that that is then going to define other decisions and constraints and consequences, right? It's like, most people don't want to give me money yeah. for my game. Most people didn't want to give me money for my last game. You know, the broad scheme of things, the average person is like, no, thank you. I will keep this $25 for something else. And so by going to a publisher, you're kind of, you are, you have to hand off things. You have like a publisher, like if you're lucky enough to kind of catch there, you need to find the right, the a publisher that does work similar to what you want. Um, you need to be willing to let go of things. They know the market is going to respond better to this theme or this level of detail. They might like completely shift something because they know it'll sell 40% more units. And if you want to go to a publisher, the core of that experience, which I haven't done, is basically pitching it with that understanding, right? Here is the hook. Here is why I think you can sell a bunch of copies. Now I expect you, the publisher, to make a bunch of other decisions. And so trying to figure out how you as the designer kind of weave that, like, I bring you a bunch of things, but I need to like sell you on a particular feature. Yeah, that's sounds challenging. So you didn't do that. <laughs> I didn't do that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I said, I said, no, I know what I want this game to be. With Roland One, Ben told me that with Roland One, I was going to even have a particularly hard time because board game publishers don't sell sports games. The people who like sports and people who like board games don't overlap a ton. It's not broadly true, but it's mm. true enough in terms of like, who comes into your average board game shop? The core purchaser is not looking for that. There might be plenty of people who are like, oh, I'm looking for a gift for like my uncle and like seeing a golf game. And they'll just be like, do you have any games about golf? Looking at the different people that come into a shop, Ben basically said, it's probably going to be hard to find a publisher for a sports-based board game, mm -hmm. and so I decided, screw it, let's go to let's go to Kickstarter. And once I try did that again. once, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it, and it, uh, let's try it again. I learned a lot. I learned mm -hmm. a ton from Stonemeyer. I learned a ton from uh, another friend there in that community, Andrew Nerger, behind the games. One of the two people behind the games, Canvas, Crypt, and um, a bunch of other games, got a ton of advice. And once I made Roland One successfully, now I know what Kickstarter is. So I just kind of rather go that way. Did you set up like a kind of a community of Discord or like how did you spread the news basically? Uh, going to a lot of events and building up my email list is probably the primary thing. I am not really a community manager. I'm not really a cheerleader. Like you need someone there, right? Who's kind of actively responding to players and kind of like that constant engagement. And I just did not, I, I have a small private discord. If ever it makes sense, I will make it public, but it's, it's like a small community of just like really close friends. And it's just like a space like to update, you know, my group of, you know, it's like the guy I grew up with and, you know, like a couple mm -hmm. other people like that. And the fact that that is almost always silent tells me how much I am oh. not the person who should run a Discord. You know, like we're never doing it. No one's ever commenting in there. It'll go like eight months be between anything being posted in there. So the okay. last thing I should do is start a new Discord and like try and make a public facing one. Okay. 
I see. There yeah. are different uh, tactics. For me, it's been going to events, getting the game in front of people, saying, hey, you you don't know if this is fun, why don't you play it for 20 minutes? Yeah. So I've met you at GDC as an event, but what other events are we talking about? Just before GDC, I went to a board game event called Dice Tower West. There were about 3,300 people there, full, like, five-day just play board games uh, in a hotel for awesome. days. I got a demo table there. Uh, three weeks before that was another small event in the in the Bay Area called Dundracon, um, which was kind of a role playing and board games event that ran for three days, uh, four days. I was there for two and a half, three days, and I was just in their proto spiel room, which is kind of the play testing room. I go to KublaCon, which is like an event in the Bay as well. Be traveling to Gen Con, which is kind of the biggest board game convention in the US. And then I just go to a lot of like little events. There's a lot of like little board game events. And I'm really lucky that uh, the board, uh, the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area has a group called the Golden Gate Game Makers. Mm -hmm. And if anyone is interested and you want to play test, and you happen to be in this small, small part of the world, it's a really good community for playtest events for board game designers. Yeah, I hear you focus a lot on your continent. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> so, oh, related I, to the uh, Kickstarter <laughs> itself as well? Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's like all in America, basically, right? I, I would rather it not be all in America, but right now the... Um, I want this game to exist beyond that. Believe me, I would like to sell it to more people. I did communicate with a company that's based out of France, does do um, sales into Europe. Because of the way that regulation works, I need to um, basically, I would need to personally register with all the different companies, uh, countries to sell there. Otherwise, that costs get passed on to the customer. But if I do that, then that's like its own messy thing, which is pretty scary when I was reading about it. And mm -hmm. so the standard process seems to be there are com companies with warehouses who you will essentially give them the rights to your game in Europe, right? So I would say, okay, X company is going to get the rights. They're the person who sells it. They essentially buy it from me and then they get to sell it. And because they have all these things, they're already in the Europe. They have, you know, a bunch of other things. They kind of take the legal and financial burden. I have just a, a short thing where I'm there like, okay, we want to buy a case or, you know, I'll send them X amount of cases. However, those have fees. The company that I talked with that seemed to be a good one, it's just a thousand euro to do business. Like if you mm -hmm. send them any product, Product, it's a thousand euro on top of all the other like financial fees and shipping it to them. Like I don't have a thousand euro just lying around. They expect 200 backers minimum to go mm. to Europe before they would really say it probably make financial sense. If I have 40 backers in Europe, I am losing money and that's, I'd rather not lose money. Yeah, that's a very calculation uh, that you need to make uh, on uh, different stuff. Yep, I have some I have some spreadsheets and when this is all done, I um, I might like share those spreadsheets just as like a transparency thing. Because oh, I, you know, nice. I would be happy to just like show how many different steps are. It's like this adds a, this adds thirty cents. This adds, you know, forty cents, or this adds like three percent. Yeah, I think that's nice because I think most of us we have no clue behind the curtains, right? It's just you see mm -hmm. on Kickstarter they ask an amount, but it's never really said like, oh, where does the amount go? To? I think a lot of us have also found that when you talk about that stuff kind of matters. Most people during the campaign, they don't actually care about those details. They're just looking at the product and saying, is this good? How much is it going to cost me? The more you put on your page, the more, you know, it's like you're deciding how much to kind of like present to people. And when you're at the customer phase where you want them to buy, those actual background details are less relevant because it, they are less relevant to you right now. They're really interesting, like, or to me, right? Like I'm a nerd about it, right? <laughs> But um, I imagine that's why we're here, right? As we're, you know, having this conversation about the details. But the average person is like, do you have a fun game? You know, it's like, tell me about your game. Oh, yes, I'm excited. Oh, not, I'm, no, I'm not excited. Or yes, I'm excited. How much? And then, oh, that's too expensive. Or no, I could do that. I kind of like unfolding that during the post, like during the updates that I'll give to backers. 
is like, hey, you know, you've backed this now. While the next like 10 months of like production processes are happening um, and we're waiting for it, let me give you some random details. During everything, I think you learn a lot, but what's your biggest like uh, thing that you learned during this, this adventure of, well, uh, making this game. I think that everyone has interesting ideas and I think everyone when you're trying to design a game is you should always listen to people and you should try to hear the you know ideas behind what they're saying and I am super slow to change my game. Like if I get like 20 people saying something, that doesn't mean I'm going to change anything. It just means <laughs> you have to then figure out, are they seeing the game you're seeing mm -hmm. or are they seeing something different? And if they're seeing something different, is that something that you also like and you're, you know, it's like you haven't found it or you haven't expressed it correctly. And so it's like, if I've learned anything, it's games are a, a creative, their creation, they are a designed thing. You have to put a box around it. You know, it's like, I chose that when cars get too far away, they fade off the board and gun it because I decided that the thing that I cared about was the social interaction more than the like big strategic map. That is a design decision. Anyone decides they're make, gonna make a game, they are making a design decision AKA they, they are bringing their own creative process to say, I'm putting the box here. This is where the box is and everything's are in or out of that. No matter how simulation-y, it's gonna have those boundaries. That's what I've learned is just like recognizing that I, I put that box there and anyone making a game, it's about like figuring out what you want inside and outside of that box and how that makes you know the experience. But is it harder to kind of put someone in a target audience with board games because it's a total different field? I don't think it's that much different. I, I mean, I think maybe video game audience is slightly narrower. Uh, or, I don't know. This is actually a really good question. I think, it, I think it depends on the platform, right? Because it's like, I would say more people play, you know, Candy Crush and mobile games and things like that than board games and, you know, mm -hmm. well, but then more people play like chess and Go and checkers and things and, you know, think the platform you design for whether it's a board game or a mobile game or a VR game, you just kind of have to recognize the things it's going to push your audience towards. A mobile game, they are likely to set it down for any number of reasons. You know, it's a very manipulable object. You know, it's like I'm holding my smartphone. The use case of me holding my smartphone is constant, right? The use case of me like playing a board game, much mm -hmm. less constant. The use case of me using a VR game, even less constant than that. Recognizing the places that people are likely to be mm -hmm. and when they're motivated to engage with a game or your game or any game and the likelihood that they'll do it again or that they'll stop playing and how they'll stop playing. I think is like a factor to consider. Oh, I think it's, it's very good that you name this factor because indeed that is totally like it influences so many aspects of making the game, mm -hmm. getting your audience ready and that kind of stuff. Oh, this yeah. is really, really nice. Yeah. What was the biggest hurdle in the, in the, in, in the whole adventure? Calling it done, <laughs> which it's, it's still not done. Like I said, people say uh, like, oh, like I, I want to explore what if, what if the scenery, you know, what if we're working like towards a particular thing and what if how, you know, we're engaging with setting matters. You're like, that's a lot of good design space. Oh man, should I be exploring that? Would the game be better? The, you know, what's going on inside of the car? What's going on around it? What's going, you know, the numbers, like how many of these different types of things should there be? You know, how big should the decks be? How diverse should those things be? That's been the biggest hurdle is I don't entirely know if I put that box around the perfect amount. I'd like to think I've I've done a pretty good job. Yeah, I think I, th I think there are things I'm missing and things that I probably over created. I, I hear some uncertainty about your iteration time period. Un tell me more. What do you mean? Well, iteration is like that you're adjusting stuff and like keep mm -hmm. on changing it, and you're not sure if you should keep on changing it or staying in the same boat? Well, you've probably heard it. It's like a game is never done. It's just shipped. Yeah, yeah, yes, for sure. You know, yeah. I think that's, that's really the situation is kind of, I just didn't quite know, like, okay, I, I have to pull the trigger at some point. It's like, okay, I think it's only getting like 
two percent better now right or i think it's only getting like 0.5 percent better right if it's getting like four percent better you know in an iteration then keep working right because that's you know it's like if it's getting like 20 percent better every time you're playing it keep messing with things you know there's just so many little details kind of all around the edges and at some point you just kind of say like okay this is going in a box I can tink the, tinker with this forever. You know, I could do another set of cards or I could discard these ones. Probably the biggest thing that I would like to do, but I think I need to call this done, is some sense of legacy games. You know, some <laughs> sense of... It, right, exactly. It's a terrifying... It already is scope. <laughs> yes, exactly. But there's, I think there, I think there are smart ways that it could be done. And there are like, there is a thing that people have talked about, which is wanting kind of like a, a longer term engagement with the game. You know, it's so like, oh, how do I, you know, make sure that I'm carrying, you know, over time. And I decided to make a game that was more about like, okay, you can throw together a bunch of combinations, see what it's like and play it. And if you want to play it again, throw it together in a, in a new arrangement. Because to me, that was more about the light hearted, quick, you know, wild nature of the game. But there is a variant of this. There is design space that I just ultimately had to say, no, I'm not doing this for the Kickstarter version of the game. I'm not doing this for V1. Like if this is very successful, I can start to unpack what that might look like, but I am really happy with what's in the box now. And I'm just like, oh God, there's like all this design space and people are not wrong that it's worth exploring. I just don't think it, it's a different game. I think if I hear this correctly, there is this, uh, a notice of that you didn't have a fixed deadline that is going to, is challenging to, okay, but I should set a fixed deadline. That's what I hear, <laughs> because like basically at school, we often say to students, finish this project in this period, and then they're like, oh, I need to make all decisions to, to have that <laughs> end date. But if I hear this correctly, you didn't have an end date, and that kind of felt also a bit in insecure. It, it's bad. It's, it's bad, bad to not have an end date. <laughs> but that's, that's why I say, you know, like coming back to the earlier thing we talked about, which is whether you decide to make this a commercial product or not. You know, it's mm -hmm. like, I am making this to sell to people, right? Yeah. Like I am making this to sell to people. If you're not making a thing to sell to people, deadlines don't matter, right? Yeah. You know, it's like you can tinker with something forever. I would highly suggest no matter what, you do kind of like put a, like an endpoint on something yes. um, exactly for what you're saying. So I also taught game design and I gave a talk on constraints because I think people way undervalue deadlines and mm -hmm. limits. What I like to tell people is that if you don't have a limit, you can never finish something and you want to finish, right? And like the, and the other reason you want to finish, if, if you don't like say, this is it, that then you don't have the next version. And the next version is often better, right? You know, it's like, because by completing a box around it, you're like, okay, I know now everything inside of that box I just created, you know, I animated a goat <laughs> in, a, in an action platform, you know, a puzzle platformer called the scapegoat two. It was like, I had to complete the animation on the goat to know it wasn't good. You know, I wasn't just tinkering with like the walk cycle. It was like, no, let's let's get the complete thing. And we used it for like months. And it was like the, you know, the, the creator Ian was kind of like, he didn't, he, he knew it wasn't shippable, right? He knew it wasn't the final thing, but it was like, we needed to get feedback from other people. I knew it wasn't, it shouldn't be the final piece of art. Um, but it was done, you know, it was like one of those things where we did it and finishing it kind of enabled us to say later, okay, that isn't good enough. Mm -hmm. Do it again. Yeah. You know, and it's like, if you, if you can create a good length of a cycle, then you create like a, a good opportunity for that revision. Yeah, with Gunnet, it's, it's the same thing where it's just kind of like, okay, packaging Gunnet is very different than like going to a board game play test night and playing it. It's very easy to change board games. It's very difficult to change a video game as you keep working on it. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, fair enough. Yeah, yeah. I think we covered a lot. Uh, if you have some <laughs> less thing that you were like, oh, but I no, wanted to no, share something. You, you, you've heard enough from me. Uh, uh, um, <laughs> okay. Yeah, for anyone interested, gunnit.gg. Uh, you yes. can find me at randio.net. Um, I have an email list somewhere. Um, and then he will probably... send you an email. Yeah. <laughs> so. yeah. 
<laughs> That's great. Okay. Thank you very much for all your wisdom uh, that you shared here. And uh, thanks yeah. for having me. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> so, and uh, see you in the next uh, interview. Um, I'm going to interview Dan, uh, the developer from Rogue Angels. So, I hope you're also very excited for that one. <laughs> so, bye bye. Awesome. <laughs>